here at Avi Networks, we start a meetup group called Container Networking and Application Services. The primary intent was to start a group where we can have discussions about either container networking or the application services as the, topic, as the name of the group is. Um, by application services, I mean uh, could be service discovery, service proxy, micro-segmentation, resource scheduler, container management, all of these services that go around your microservices applications. So one of the reasons why we started this was that we saw that we, there were either groups around Docker, Docker networking or specific to a platform, but nothing that abstracted the technology out of the vendor or the platform name itself. If you're coming in, we're just starting in um, batches, pizza and beer in the back. Um, we have some obvious stickers on the table as well. Um, as you can see, I'm sporting one um, on my shirt right here. Uh, these are called badass stickers. We also have, I think, badass.io or org. I will check and let you guys know. So if you want, you can even post your pictures there. Um, look up for badass. Uh, we kind of uh, spread these stickers like plague. So you can see the stickers everywhere. We Anywhere Avi Networks is there, um, at any event, you will see the stickers. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome our really honorable speakers today. I have two kick -ass speakers at the Badass uh, Meetup Group. <laughs> um, Andrew and Andre from the Project Titus Group at Netflix um, are here to share their plumbing the Netflix, Netflix Container Cloud into AWS VPC. I know it's a mouthful of title, but I will let Andrew, Andrew start it and help us explain, uh, at least help us understand. Hey guys, um, my name is Andrew, uh, this is Andre, and uh, today we'll be talking a little bit about how uh, we built a uh, container cloud for Netflix on top of the AWS VPC, and we also have stickers, so that's a bribe to come and chat with us afterwards, um, and uh, feel free to interject with any questions whenever you have them, feel free to interrupt. Um, and. I'll do my best to not use as many AWS acronyms and things, so if you don't know what they are, just let me know and I'll, uh, I'll explain it. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, um, Netflix is a streaming service. We just went worldwide in January. Uh, we now have uh, over 80 million subscribers. Um, we have a big focus on uh, Netflix original movies and TV shows, um, and that's driving a lot of uh, where we're putting money and investing in studios and th that kind of thing. Um, but some of the numbers behind Netflix um, are as we went worldwide, we got into over 190 countries. Uh, we have over 100 million hours of streaming going on daily. You can judge whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for society. We like it. It's good for us. Um, at peak times, we're roughly a third of all North American internet download traffic, um, so there's a lot of content moving. Uh, the company itself is roughly 2,000-ish people, um, and about 1,400 of them are in tech some fashion. Uh, we're a microservice-based architecture. We have roughly 500-ish microservices. Um, those are run across tens of thousands of EC2 VMs. So, Netflix has been kind of all in on AWS since the early days going back to 2008 or so. So it's a space we've been investing in heavily both from being cloud native and being a, uh, a microservices architecture. Um, so over that period of time, what we've built is this uh, cloud native architecture. It has the immutable infrastructure concepts where we're uh, baking our infrastructure and deploying it and not changing it on the fly. Um, and it's all built on top of AWS. So this picture here is actually a live shot of the AWS microservice uh, network in action. This is actually what it was doing two weeks ago. Um, when we took this picture, it's with an actually an open source, a Netflix open source tool called Visceral. Um, now let me get off of Slack, sorry. This architecture we've been working on for, for years on VMs. Um, and yet we're still continuing to invest in containers. Um, so some of what's pushing us to look at the container space is 
Um, it provides us with a simpler packaging for microservices and batch jobs. Traditionally, Netflix has been a largely Java shop. Uh, however, looking at where we're going with increased investment in studio production and different kinds of um, applications, we tend to find we're becoming more and more polyglot um, and uh, container packaging helps with that a lot. Uh, it also provides a much more easy to understand interface to the cloud for users. I can just configure how much resource my application needs and I go. Um, and it also provides a consistent development experience for uh, our developers. What I build and run locally gets hermetically sealed. I push it to the cloud and the same thing is running in production. Um, so those are a couple of the key things driving us. What's kind of interesting here also is one of the things that you often see as a big container uh, motivator is cost. I can pack things down and r do more with less. And yes, that's true. Um, but for us, the key focus is not around using containers to save money. It's they're an enabler for us to go faster to in in innovate faster. And that's really what makes it interesting for us. So in the VM world, developers will generally start with uh, an AMI, which is the Amazon machine image, like a VMDK, it's their VM format. Um, so you're basically provisioning a whole OS. And I'm starting with this. Traditionally, it's been kind of Java optimized because that's where our microservices have been. So if you're a Java application, there's a lot of tools on there that are really great for you. If you're anything else, you're kind of out on your own. Um, and if I want to then make those customizations, I'm changing the entire operating system and things like that. And um, then when I want to actually scale my application up or down, I'm moving at the speed of EC2 VM launches. However, in containers, it's much easier where I can just basically pick whatever base image I want to start with that fits my application. If I need to change anything, I'm only bringing in what I care about for my application. Um, and I'm only defining the resources my application requires. So I don't have to worry about AWS EC2 types and this one's getting deprecated and this new one is coming out and all those kinds of things. I just say, I need this much compute, this much memory, this much storage, and I go. And then as I scale my application over time, I'm moving at the speed of process start time. I'm not moving at the speed of VMs anymore. So there's a big motivation to move there, but Netflix is kind of in an interesting spot in that it's not a greenfield application, right? We have a well-tested, robust VM microservice architecture, so we don't just come in, rip it out, and throw something new in. We're actually having to find how we're going to plug in containers into this existing ecosystem. So all of the microservices that are running at Netflix are already built with built to run on the Netflix cloud platform. So what makes up the Netflix cloud platform is our own internal uh, service discovery, uh, telemetry, um, management tools, those kinds of things. A lot of them are open source if you go to uh, uh, Netflix OSS on GitHub, there's a whole bunch of info about the Netflix cloud platform there. Um, so a lot of the, the uh, applications we have are built to leverage that, right? So it's important for us when an application moves to a container, all that same infrastructure is there for them. Similarly, the microservices are built to be on AWS. They expect a lot of that infrastructure. I want to access S3. I'm going to protect my uh, communication with security groups and IAM roles and those kinds of things. So we're not trying to abstract away the cloud. We're very much becoming part of the rest of the infrastructure as a service that we provide. Um, additionally, when you look at the architecture we have for VMs today, it's highly scalable, highly reliable, and has a ton of functionality. So it puts a pretty high bar for what we need to meet when our customers migrate to containers. So what that means is it makes it a little bit difficult to take an off-the-shelf solution, um, a Kubernetes, a Nomad, a Docker Swarm, and just plug it in into this world. We're kind of looking for a very specific puzzle piece that's going to fit into the Netflix ecosystem that provides largely just container runtime that can then branch out to the rest of the Netflix world. Um, so a lot of that drove us to build um, our own container cloud called Titus. 
It is um, a container runtime. It's built on top of Apache Mesos, and that's running on top of uh, AWS. So part of what was nice about using Mesos is it gives us a lot of the cluster management uh, features but also gives us the flexibility to define how we want to plug into AWS here and plug into the Netflix ecosystem there. Uh, a couple of the key areas we've put innovation is around scheduling. Um, we do uh, job management uh, for both uh, microservices, uh, batch jobs, and we've also recently started to do stream processing. Um, and we are working on top of AWS, so the scheduler has to be, you know, uh, natively aware of the fact that I can scale up my infrastructure, I can scale down my infrastructure, things are ephemeral, as sort of the world it, it is expected to work in. Um, and then on the container execution side, there's been a lot of work around integrating uh, Docker with AWS so that your application uh, can access the same AWS resources you expect to be able to access, uh, and also plumbing the uh, containers with the Netflix infrastructure, um, and Andre will talk uh, definitely more in depth about those in a little bit. Um, so where is Titus today? Um, so this is uh, a week's worth of workload from, I guess, what, uh, last week, basically. Um, and this is a single region, our U.S. East region. Uh, on the top of this graph, we ran just over 100,000 containers in test. Um, that week in just over 100,000 containers in test, or sorry, in prod that week. Um, at peak, we're generally ramping up to roughly uh, 1,800 total uh, AWS VMs, and they're a mix of R3 8XLs and M4 4XLs, which uh, for those who don't know, the R3 8XL is a pretty big, beefy box. It's uh, 32 cores, 250 gigs of memory, and a terabyte of storage, I believe. Um, and what's running on top of these is a mix of, like I was mentioning before, uh, microservices, batch jobs, and stream processing. Um, as we uh, look at how applications have migrated, very early, a lot of that was batch applications moving to containers. One, because it's they're more, a little, little easier to port and move around. Um, the other is that there wasn't as much infrastructure for them, so coming to a container where it's polyglot and easier to run with uh, made it very easy. And then we've been strategically onboarding uh, microservices as we come on, making sure it makes sense for that particular use case and they're gonna get value out of being uh, in a container. So uh, kind of a high level, you know, 10,000 foot view of what makes up Titus is we have uh, a scale out uh, Titus Master. It's uh, single leader, multi failover replicas. Um, it's based on Mesos, and the master is made up of kind of two key pieces, one of which is uh, the decoupling of our job management from our scheduling, where we have the concept of job managers that understand the life cycle of a particular type of job. So we have a job manager that knows how I should be managing microservices, a job manager that knows how to be managing batch jobs, a job manager that knows how to manage stream processing, but they all communicate with a common scheduling library that's able to take a global view of all the resources available and work with those job managers to do an optimal placement across the cloud. Um, that uh, scheduling library is called Fenzo. It's uh, one of the Netflix open source projects, so you guys should check that out um, if you're interested. Um, and then on the uh, uh, worker side, we have Titus Agents, are our uh, worker nodes that are actually running containers. They are using Docker as the container runtime. Um, we're using ZFS to provide some amount of uh, storage uh, isolation and being Mesos based uh, we're using Mesos agent to communicate back and forth with the Mesos master. Um, and kind of a few key pieces here, I think Andre will touch on these a little bit more later, are a Titus executor, which is the Mesos framework executor for Titus, which is basically the guts of knowing how to run a Titus container and what that means um, in our context. And then um, two key pieces here are our VPC network driver and metadata proxy, which enable us to do uh, IP per container. It enables us to do security group and IAM roles um, and things like that. And uh, Andre will 
talk about that a little bit more in depth. So it's, you know, we kind of got to the space where, okay, we have a, a robust VM architecture. We now have a container runtime that can plug into the same thing. So now I have two sort of parallel competing runtimes. How do I work with this and manage this? If I'm an application developer, do I go to a container? Do I work in a VM? Do I migrate? What, what, what do I do? Um, and it's, you know, I have to understand both of them and how they work. Um, and one of the, the key pieces of Netflix infrastructure we've, we've integrated with that helps us with that is uh, a tool called Spinnaker. It's another Netflix open source project, um, and it's our continuous delivery tool. So it basically gives us a common infrastructure as developers to deploy and manage applications. So whether I'm running in a VM, whether I'm running in a container, I still go to Spinnaker, I still deploy my application the same way, I still manage it the same way. So it gives a very common platform even as the runtimes might be changing. So what that means is for Titus, the integration with the Netflix infrastructure is even more critical because it's really kind of abstracted away from the user in, in some of that sense. Um, so I might be wanting to communicate with our telemetry system Atlas in a VM and running and using it in uh, a container. So Spinnaker definitely um, is a key for that. So um, it provides common application configuration. The way I set up my application is the same. Um, it's basically built around this notion of cloud drivers. So it's a continuous delivery tool and it has a pluggable model where a cloud driver could be, I'm gonna to deploy to AWS. A cloud driver could be, I'm gonna to deploy to Titus. It also supports um, Kubernetes. It supports uh, GCE. It's working on supporting Azure and OpenStack right now. Um, and those are all collaborations with, um, with other companies to get those going. So, um, <clears throat> but across all of them, it then provides common deployment strategies I can do uh, red black deployments, I can do Highlander, or other kinds of strategies, and it provides common health check infrastructure. I can know when I'm running an application in a container, is it healthy? Same way I know if an application is running in a VM that it's healthy, uh, and a common security configuration. So the same way I would configure security groups and IMs when I go for a VM is now parallel um, in a container. So we'll kind of run through a quick example of what it's like to deploy a container at Netflix. Um, so we'll run with an example application called OSS Tracker. And this is actually a real application uh, that we use internally that monitors the health of our open source projects. So it looks at how many open issues there are for a project, how many commits there have been, how many comments there are, and it sort of gives you a score as to whether your project is healthy or stale or things like that. So uh, I'm going to want to create a server group for it, and I'm going to select that I'm going to run. Normally, I could choose to run on AWS natively, where I'm going to be running in a container, or I can choose to run on Titus. Um, and then I'm going to pick uh, a Docker registry to pull from, and I'm going to have my Docker image, and I'm going to specify my image and tag. Um, and then I'm going to set up how I want to deploy this thing. So I now have an image. Um, here, I can kind of set up how I want to deploy my application. Here, we've selected Red Black, which is basically going to deploy a new cluster of my application while disabling the old. The idea being, if there's something wrong with my new application, I need to do a quick failback. The old is a hot standby at this point. Um, and the only uh, real resource configuration I need to do is just select do, how much CPU do I need, how much memory do I need, how much uh, disk do I need, and do I want IP connectivity. And then some of the other features down below are uh, some of the AWS aspects of IAM roles and security groups for security. So I click the deploy button, these things run out on Titus, uh, your containers come up, and I see these little chiclets here. Each chiclet is gonna represent a container running your application. Um, and green here is good. Green means it's passing health checks. So uh, to get there, that means that your application is bootstrapping in a way that 
all of the Netflix common applications are going to come up and expose a health check port, um, have some mechanism for your application to hook in to that so that they can say, for whatever it means for my application to be healthy, I can register what that means. Um, and all that's connecting and working kind of the same way it does in a VM. So part of that is done via uh, how we inject environment variables into the containers. So a lot of the mechanism for that is when, say, our service discovery client comes up, it's going to say, hey, where am I running? What application am I? Those kinds of things. And it's learning those via environment variables. So as you deploy your application on Titus, Titus knows that. Titus is populating those same things. So for a lot of the libraries that uh, users are running, the environment looks the same on a container as a VM. So it makes it much, much easier for them. There's not a whole lot of you know, porting their application to containers that has to happen. Um, we've even enabled, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Netflix Chaos Monkey. Um, it's basically a mechanism to live test application availability. It's going out and actually configured to shoot your services in production. Um, and if you deploy in a VM, you can configure it to say, hey, every, you know, once a day, at some random time, shoot an instance. Um, and you can do the same thing with containers. Um, so it's kind of an example of uh, some of the Netflix infrastructure. So some of the Netflix infrastructure actually changing to become container aware. So Chaos Monkey was originally built and it know how to go out to EC2 VMs and kill EC2 VMs. Uh, once Titus is there, Chaos Monkey was changed to say, okay, I'm going to become Titus aware. I'm going to know there's an application running in a container, and I'm going to know how I can take that container down. Um, so some of the scheduling work that we've done um, for Titus, I mentioned earlier, we decouple um, scheduling from job management. So that gives us an easy way to handle new kinds of jobs, but they all get a common mechanism for doing intelligent uh, scheduling and bin packing. Um, and uh, a lot of that means that what, when I spin up a new job type use case, maybe a new stream processing, all of the infrastructure I have around hard constraints for doing, um, you know, rebalancing across availability zones um, or smart bin packing so I can efficiently scale up and scale down my cluster are all just inherited by the job managers um, in an easy way. Uh, we also work with multiple AWS instance types. So AWS has oh, uh, a whole host of instance types all optimized for different things. Com compute optimized VMs, memory optimized VMs, uh, GPU VMs, high storage VMs. So uh, we work with a variety of these, and that helps us from the scheduling standpoint of uh, we know which might be the best fit for this particular kind of application without the user having to worry about it and you know, manage all 50 or whatever, how many instance types there are. Um, one other piece we're working on um, that's going to be a little bit further down the road is management of the Netflix internal spot market. So basically, it's a mechanism for us to know when and how to use free AWS instances. So you imagine the Netflix workload, it's pretty uh, cyclical. People come home from work at 5 or 6 or 7 p.m. You're home, you're on the couch, you flip on Netflix, our usage goes up. You go to bed, you see around 11 o'clock, midnight, usage goes down, it's 2 a.m., you don't have that much going on, right? So during those times, that means we can take those unused instances, bring them in here, and ramp up our fleet for, say, doing batch processing and computation um, in the background. Um, one of the other key aspects we recently introduced is around uh, the concept of multiple tiers. So when we do have batch applications and we do have microservices, there's a concept of there's a microservice that might be affecting the ability for uh, us to stream a service or for us to interact with uh, a digital studio somewhere. That thing might need to actually scale up right now. And even if there's a batch process um, or other jobs running, we want to make sure that guy has what he needs. So we have a concept of multiple tiers with varying levels of QoS on them. Uh, right now we have a guaranteed capacity tier where you can configure you need some sort of resource and we'll guarantee that in a worst case you will get what, you're, what you've asked for. And then an on-demand resource which is uh, a little bit more of a flexible tier that says 
Um, there's going to be a cap on what you can get. You might get, get queued in a worst case and have to wait for free resources. Um, but it's a, a cheaper and more elastic uh, mechanism. So I'd mentioned a little bit earlier about the, the integration with the, the Netflix platform. Um, so we inject the context for the container to make it look like a uh, Netflix VM from the environment variable standpoint. And then some of the uh, Netflix infrastructure pieces are then made container aware. So Eureka is our open source service discovery uh, uh, service. And it's aware of it's going to boot up into uh, a container. It's going to know it's in a container and register the container specific IP address with the service discovery server. The service discovery server is going to know how to uh, access this thing and uh, check its availability by querying Titus. So for these kinds of things, the infrastructure pieces have changed to become container aware so that the user and microservices applications don't. Um, uh, one of the other key pieces we've worked on is um, integrating application insights and telemetry with containers so that you're running in a container and I have metrics that might say how many requests per second I'm, uh, I'm, I'm serving. Um, and if I'm seeing issues, part of the way I debug that is I go and I look at what's going on on the host. Am I using too much CPU? Uh, am I disk bound? Am I network bound? What's going on? So um, we've built mechanisms to actually take those system metrics, which were traditionally uh, VM-centric. Basically, I expect you have the whole box. We're going to collect metrics and publish them, and then you can debug that way. Now we're running with multiple containers all on the same host, and we want to be able to say, OK, um, for your container on this host that has maybe two CPUs and this much memory, uh, how much of that are you using? I don't necessarily, it's not useful necessarily to say how much is available on the box because that's not available to me and it might just throw me off on how I'm doing my debugging. So we uh, introduced uh, an Intel open source telemetry framework called SNAP, which is actually doing the kind of container level metrics collection and publishing that out to uh, Atlas, which is uh, again our uh, Netflix open source telemetry system. Um, and this is kind of where I'll, I'll let Andre pick up. Um, we did a lot of work around integrating the Docker experience with the AWS experience. So just booting up a container in Docker on EC2 is not the same thing as running an in, you know, EC2 instance. There's a lot of work that we had to do to make that integration seamless for users. Um, so I think I'll hand it over to Andre and let him talk a bit about uh, how we do VPC and IP management um, and security around that. Any, any questions I can answer? You talked about uh, that you had these processes that are all feeding into the metrics. Um, do y'all have a, like, for every container is a standard method of logging so that y'all get um, decent, uh, not garbage in, garbage out? Yeah, so we have um, both a common mechanism for doing log management. Um, so as applications are producing log files, they're both viewable in real time from the container as well as we do um, uploading um, through that. Depending on the application, some applications might just do routine log uploading. Some of them also might integrate with other Netflix platform pieces like uh, we have a stream processing system, so if you're trying to inject real-time environment or real-time events, you can you know still do that through the container. Um, and uh, then the telemetry piece is uh, we're collecting metrics on the host and then shipping those out to the telemetry system, and you can then graph and build dashboards and and that kind of thing. Do you use NRPE? NRPE? Yeah, that NetGuild, that uh, telemetry type of tool? Uh, no, I'm not familiar with that, no. Um, talk up. Sure. Hi, there was one architecture slide you showed in which uh, on the worker node there were many components. So all those components need to run on all the workers or is it on few worker nodes? Yeah, what, what I was showing there is those services are all running on all of the workers. Um, and it's kind of a, uh, 
uh, the worker is like a microservice, and on the worker are like microservices. So all of them are kind of doing specific tasks. Uh, the VPC driver piece is just managing IP. Metadata proxy is managing a certain proxying job. Um, uh, our executor is talking back to Mesos, things like that. So if I see one worker on one worker, there are like seven or eight services, which you could say like system services, and then there will be like application services, which are different. Exactly, yeah, so that one host might have, like you said, seven or eight system services, and then maybe it's running 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever containers. That's why you have like bigger hosts on AWS, I believe. Yeah, um, so some of the bigger hosts help with being able to pack more tightly and not have to worry about as many VMs. Hi, so when you said you're moving some microservices to the uh, containers from the VM, what is the criteria you use to decide from like so many microservices you have? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's generally not us deciding. It's the application owners themselves saying there's some pain point they have that they think containers will help them with, um, whether it's uh, how they want to be able to scale, the developer experience they're struggling with, um, something around packaging. So often it's them saying, hey, I think containers can help, and then coming to us and discussing if that's a use case that, that makes sense. So how do you manage uh, load balancing across similar type of microservices and in the same way also order scaling of those microservices? So uh, kind of two answers there. One is the, the Netflix platform has uh, its own load, load balancing system called Ribbon um, that is integrated, again, another plug for Netflix open source. Um, it's out there and it integrates with our service discovery system. So uh, an application that's using that when it boots up um, in a container, it'll, it'll be seamless for that load balancing library. Um, um, however, it's, you know, that's, those are for internal services. Um, we don't have any integration with things like an AWS ELB or anything at that moment, um, but that's something that we're looking at. Um, and then you had a second question around? Auto scaling, right. Um, so we have, today a mechanism for you're running your microservice and you can configure, I want to have uh, a minimum of this number, uh, a maximum of this number of instances, and currently a desired value with this. And today that's a manually configured value, and we're working on making that automatic and actually plugging in to use the same uh, cl AWS CloudWatch metrics that are done in the VM world so that uh, by default, when your application is running, it's probably configured th that, uh, to be registering uh, CloudWatch events for how much CPU am I using, what's my request per second, things like that, that then become triggers for when I should be doing an auto scale. So uh, we'll be we're looking to integrate with that so that it, again, becomes kind of a seamless thing that I move from a VM to a container and all of my auto scaling metrics come along with me. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing that at the, at the application level, which means it will then, then be at the container level. So how much of the traffic uh, actually moves around within the AWS cluster compared to the traffic that you get from the external uh, clients? Meaning like... Uh, For example, if, if you get a request to stream a video, uh, would that translate to talking to a billing or to a user database lookup? And how much of the traffic is actually just within the cluster? Um, so in general, most of what would happen if you're going to start streaming a movie is you would end up going through a request to you know that big fleet of microservice uh, diagram I showed earlier. Maybe it hits billing. It's probably going to hit a database somewhere. Um, and then we have Netflix has a, a CDN called Open Connect that will then talk back out to that and stream a movie. Um, so it's. Uh, generally going to be confined to one AWS region that you're going to communicate in, so there's one microservice fleet you're working with, and then um, getting pushed out to some localized CDN that's going to stream the movie for you. Okay. Uh, quick question on the networking piece. So when you moved from uh, microservices to containers, did it matter for you whether it was a layer two or a layer three? So that's a perfect segue for Andre. That's, I think, right where he's going to pick up. 
task. I'll be talking about uh, more uh, details how we implemented networking for containers. So basically, uh, when we start uh, working on Titus platform, uh, we start thinking how we can uh, implement network. And basically, there are two aspects. Uh, so it basically, how you see containers from outside, how other services see your containers, and how uh, containers, uh, how application within container uh, see world outside. And um, basically, ideal scenario would be if it would be the same. So if you want to migrate from VM to container, you shouldn't see real difference for your application, and other applications should notice anything. So basically, there's two key things uh, which we trying to achieve. And how we can do this, uh, basically, your containers and your VMs should be in the same IP space. Uh, they should work with existing infrastructure, which uh, discovery firewalls uh, in case of AWS and security groups and everything else. Uh, so I, I also uh, port mapping thing. So uh, if you're familiar with containers and uh, when Docker just started, so basically the only solution for networking was uh, port mapping. And it uh, creates uh, kind of confusion uh, because uh, you're not accessing uh, your service directly. Uh, you're doing firewall configuration, uh, which uh, does uh, random port mapping. And so uh, from outside world, uh, you actually connect not directly to your application, but uh, you do uh, this through port mapping. So basically, we want to avoid this thing in order to make uh, application visible the same way uh, in our network. So uh, what are existing solutions? First, uh, as I mentioned, it's a standard uh, solution, which is bridge with port mapping. Uh, it works fine for bad jobs, but not for microservices. Again, because uh, you kind of get random ports, you are not getting a well-known port or port you expected. So basically, uh, you need some external data, which I will tell you how to connect to your application. Uh, other solutions, basically, are uh, overlays and um, some more uh, exotic things. Uh, who familiar with how overlay works? OK. So, so OK, more people. So basically, uh, what overlay is, it's essentially a simulation of uh, L2 network uh, on top of your existing network. And what it does, it kind of creates an uh, isolated island. So basically, you encapsulate uh, your traffic in, the, in your overlay. And so it appears kind of isolated. Um, so uh, uh, another existing solution is basically recent uh, introduction by Flannel and Wave. They uh, start supporting uh, VPC, but I mean, when we started working on this, uh, it wasn't available, so uh, we basically implemented our own solution. And what it does is uh, uh, allocate uh, local and routable IPs in VPC. Uh, basically, by allocation, uh, this type of IPs, uh, we make our containers routable directly, and uh, they become visible in, inside the network as VMs. So by the way, who uh, uses uh, AWS on a daily basis here? OK. Um, so basically, uh, as I said, um, why not overlay? Because overlay, it's crea uh, it creates uh, um <coughs> It's, it's basically uh, another level, so we need uh, the same IP space. Uh, we need to uh, work with existing discovery service. Uh, it's not possible with overlay because it's, again, isolated. Uh, transparent become uh, not a transparent migration. Uh, it's harder to achieve with overlay. It's why we don't need it. Um, again, uh, it would be easier to troubleshoot if, if you use uh, your existing network rather than introducing a new one. And by the way, uh, VPC, it's already SDN. So basically, when you try to uh, use uh, some other solution, it kind of uh, uses the same concepts as uh, VPC already implemented. So why don't we reuse existing infrastructure? And basically, you reduce a uh, number of critical components uh, you need to maintain. So it's why we decided not to use overlay and stay on uh, AWS VPC. And I will provide more details, basically, how we implemented this. Um, so uh, another thing, so how many uh, of you guys uh, did actual networking with containers? Okay. Uh, so as you probably know, there's an uh, existing mechanism in Docker which is called uh, libnetwork. Uh, it allows you uh, to do custom plugins. 
uh, it provides API. So you can implement uh, your own plugin. It's essentially an uh, independent process, which is uh, invoked by uh, Docker through HTTP protocol. Um, and basically, there's back and forth uh, where Docker requests network from your driver. Your driver returns some information, and so on. So basically, eventually, your container will be configured uh, with the network you want. Uh, so th there is another way. So it, uh, basically, one one uh, thing you can do is re re reuse this uh, uh, lib, lib network plugin mechanism. Or another way, you you can configure your network namespace directly. So who knows what network namespace is? Okay. So basically, a network namespace it's uh, isolated network configuration for your container. So uh, you so each container basically gets uh, independent network namespace. Uh, which uh, completely isolated from uh, your host machine, so you can apply configuration inside and uh, basically uh, this I I isolate containers from each other. So uh, the namespace is kind of way to refer to this independent configuration and uh, basically change it and update it. Um, so there, there are a couple of approaches. So yeah, you, you, you can configure this directly. There's a framework called CNI. Who familiar with CNI? Okay, it's kind of, it was recently introduced, but basically there's a uh, definition of protocol, uh, which parameters should be passed in order to configure uh, your namespace. So it's a little bit harder to do with Docker because uh, Docker um, doesn't allow you to access your network namespace before container started. So basically you cannot configure your net network namespace because uh, if you start your container, uh, your application might need network. And if it's not configured yet, so you basically get bad, bad experience and yeah, it's not good. So uh, there's workaround. Uh, Docker uh, supports this thing which called a net uh, equal uh, container. And you can specify ID of another container which already configured. Uh, by doing this, you kind of refer to another namespace uh, which might be already configured. So with this, uh, you uh, can achieve like you do custom configuration, you configure an existing namespace, but uh, your actual application shouldn't, uh, should wait till uh, network will be fully configured. So basically, what we're trying to do. Um, so uh, I mentioned that we're not um, using uh, Docker and lib network plugin. We basically uh, configure our network namespace directly. So why we decided not to do so? Who, who tried this thing? Who tried lib network? Uh, okay. So uh, but basically, we realized uh, we, we used this for some time, uh, but then we realized it's not very flexible because uh, we have pretty specific requirements. We want to pass information about security groups, about uh, bandwidth. Uh, we want to allocate for a particular container, and it's uh, it's really hard with. Uh, lib network mechanism, so it kind of isolates your configuration from actual container, which uh, will consume this configuration. So also it introduced a shared state, and uh, basically uh, how uh, lib network API works. It splits your configuration in a uh, number of steps. It's kind of create network, create endpoint, join, uh, and so on. So basically you're not, you're not getting entire configuration in one step, so you should uh, do exchange of parameters. So this is quite inconvenient because it's essentially a shared state. So also it uh, requires you to implement uh, two components. It's uh, IP allocation management module plus uh, actual configuration piece. And it's also shared state between these two uh, things. I mean, for us, it didn't work because, uh, I mean, we need to know uh, actual IP allocation information and configuration. Uh, we, we need them together. We don't want to separate them in two pieces. Uh, another, another inconvenient thing here, so basically because uh, there's shared state, some configuration applied by Docker and uh, some configuration should be applied by your driver. And uh, basically it's less convenient because you have less control. So, and yeah, as I said, we implemented our own solution and uh, some high level overview. Uh, basically it's a standalone process uh, implemented in uh, Golang uh, it provides simple HTTP API, so you can call, uh, and there's two calls essentially. One is create network configuration, and another one is destroy. So when you when you get configuration, you, you get configuration is just uh, fully ready, and you can just 
uh, join it with your application container. So this solution basically self-contained. There's no shared state. There's simple call which creates your configuration and that's it. It allows us uh, um, basically completely isolate network configuration uh, piece and uh, pro pro provide ready to use configuration to containers independently from other pieces of executor. Uh, Okay, so uh, also it has uh, modular structure and uh, I will uh, discuss all uh, modules one by one. So how it's integrated, uh, it integrated with uh, existing uh, Titus infrastructure. So basically, uh, as Andrew mentioned, there's uh, Titus Mesos executor. So it's kind of orchestration layer, which uh, accepts uh, requests from uh, master and uh, start uh, tasks. So uh, before it starts actual tasks, uh, it invokes uh, Titus network driver process ask for network configuration, it gets a uh, uh, read-to-use uh, container pod, which uh, might be uh, used by actual application container, and then it calls Docker, and uh, to Docker it uh, gives this parameter, which means, which says container and pod ID, it's basically container we got from uh, Titus network driver, and start the container. So basically there's a completely isolated piece which does network configuration, which is read-to-use. So any questions here or, yeah. This network driver which you are mentioning is the same which you mentioned in the previous slide, right? Yeah, yeah. so, so basically, uh, this is uh, details uh, how it's implemented and uh, this is how it's integrated with uh, existing Titus infrastructure. So, so the previous information was about this net network driver only, right? Yes, yes, okay. yes. And when you say, in network parameters, so the Mesos executor is giving, is asking just to create a network namespace for you. Uh, fully configured network namespace, not not just like net, network namespace. It's also applies configuration and allocates IP and so on. Are you going to give more information yeah, yes. what that has? Yes. And when you say a pod is created, it's like a Docker container only because yes. When you, it's right. Yes. Okay. Okay, so b basically there are uh, internal modules of uh, the driver. So first uh, module is uh, IP allocator. It uh, allocates an IP, it can allocate an IP from VPC or it can allocate a uh, local IP. Uh, there's a namespace allocator. It's basically a module which uh, uh, creates uh, empty namespace, uh, which uh, passed to the next module, which called namespace configurator. And uh, what namespace configurator does, it's apply Final configurations gets a IP from first module, uh, namespace reference from the second one, and uh, prepares final configuration. There's also an uh, important module which is called garbage collector, and what it does, um, basically, if, uh, if there's a situation when uh, you don't need IP any longer, if your container crashed, so we have existing configuration which should be cleaned up. So it, what it does, it also checks uh, uh, consistency between uh, state uh, on the machine and uh, VPC state because we call AWS API to get some information. Okay, so here's the flow inside the driver. So basically executor calls uh, create HTTP API. Uh, we uh, pass some parameters, basically parameters includes uh, if you want a routable or non-routable IP, if you need security groups, uh, which uh, bandwidth you need for your container. Um, so first we call IP allocator. Uh, what it does, it, uh, I, I will talk about this later, but basically it's allocate an IP. It can allocate local or VPC IP. Then uh, we do an S allocator, which prepares uh, empty namespace, and then we apply configuration. So I will describe each module later. So first module, IP allocator. Uh, who familiar with uh, VPC, basically any concept? Okay, so basically VPC, it's a uh, software-defined network in uh, AWS Cloud, and uh, there's some uh, details here. So it has concept which called uh, ENI, it's Elastic uh, Network Interface, it's essentially a virtual uh, network interface which uh, can be attached to an instance. Uh, it can be configured uh, dynamically, so you call AWS API and might change, uh, it can change configuration of your ENI. So when you attach ENI, it's detected as a hot plug device on your uh, VM. So basically you can, uh, if you have 
Linux machine, so you basically configure uh, how uh, what should be done when a device attached. Uh, so you can uh, attach multiple ENIs to your instance. So it's up to eight ENIs per instance, and based on instance type, uh, biggest instance type has eight. Uh, one ENI is always attached because basically how uh, your instance uh, has connectivity. So one ENI is always attached. So uh, because there are multiple ENIs, so people sometimes think like if you add new ENI, it increases your bandwidth, but actually it won't. So all ENIs, they share the same bandwidth uh, assigned to an instance. So they share this dynamically. Uh, depends on uh, through which ENI you get the traffic. So uh, another interesting thing which we actually use, it's fundamental for our solution, uh, ENI allows you uh, to have secondary IPs on each ENI. Uh, it could be up to 30 IPs per ENI. So one uh, IP is always primary ENI, primary IP. Uh, every, all other IPs, uh, secondary, you can use them as you want. So also the concept of security groups, who knows what security groups is? So it's, uh, so security groups is essentially like a firewall. Uh, you can refer to existing security groups and allow ingress uh, or egress, or you can uh, define like actual rules in terms of IP and subnet. So uh, when we attach an item instance, is how it would look like. So basically, when we attach, we create like new. Uh, Ethernet interface, it's Ethernet 1, it's ENI, correspond to ENI 1 in VPC, uh, Ethernet 2, uh, ENI 2, and so on. So you see there's uh, one primary IP address on each ENI and uh, some number of secondary IPs ENI. Any questions so, to understand this concept? Okay, so basically we can have this. Um, yeah, when you look at uh, AWS console, so you basically see this. Uh, so there's uh, primary uh, IP and there's secondary IPs. So uh, important thing, so uh, when secondary IP assigned to ENI, basically what happens? Actually nothing happens. You should start using it. I, I mean, but basically when secondary IP attached to ENI, it instruct uh, VPC routing tables to route traffic for this IP to an instance. But how your instance would process this traffic, it's up to you and how you configure your instance in order to process traffic for this IP. By default, there's no configuration, so you, you, you should apply this configuration by yourself. Okay, so there are fundamentals. So uh, how we uh, use the concepts I just described. First, um, we uh, use separate ANIs uh, to assign different security groups. So as I said, uh, security groups are assigned per, uh, per ENI. So basically, on your instance, if you need uh, containers which should run behind different security groups, you assign uh, them to different ENIs and attach multiple ENIs uh, to your instance. Uh, so secondary IP address be behind, assigned to each ENI used by actual containers. Um, uh, as I said, containers with different uh, security groups pl placed behind different ENIs. So this uh, P is controlled by um, our, our scheduler. So basically, we know uh, the current state, uh, which security groups and which ENI, ENI is currently allocated, and uh, which containers run where, and basically decide where we should schedule the next container. So basically, if there's ENI with existing security groups, which matches uh, your current task requirements, so it will be scheduled behind that ENI. If there's no ENI with existing security groups, um, we will attach new ENI and configure uh, your container behind this new ENI. So security groups also can be updated dynamically. So if you already have uh, ENI, but uh, you need to change security groups, so you can uh, call AWS API and update them. So and uh, to get an idea what's it, total number of IPs which can be uh, uh, available per instance. So for example, for M4 X large, so you can, uh, in, in case of Titus, so basically there's, uh, we can use uh, 3 and I multiplied by 14, so it's 42. Um, and for M4 for X large, so it's basically 200 IPs. Uh, so as I said, so why it's 3 not 4 or why it's 7 not 8? because uh, primary ENI actually not uh, used by containers. 
it used uh, by Tidus for internal purposes. So we never uh, move uh, allocate container IPs behind uh, first ENI. So it's kind of isolated from containers traffic. OK, so back to uh, IP allocator module. So um, IP allocator, uh, what was the input for this module? So it's basically uh, we tell uh, allocate routable or not routable IP. We say which security groups we need. Uh, we specify ENI number where we want to allocate on our IP. And as a result, we got IP address back. Uh, we create and attach new ENIs uh, if there's no ENI with requirements we have. So for example, if there's different security groups. Uh, we also can uh, allocate and release IPs on existing ENIs dynamically. So basically, if you uh, have 10 containers and uh, 10 IPs already allocated, and there's one more, so we allocate new IP address. When we release IPs, uh, we have IP cache. Uh, what IP cache is, um, instead of calling API and release IP back to VPC, we uh, release IP to cache. We, we keep them attached to an instance um, for some time. And a garbage collector uh, collects IPs with interval like n minutes. So today it's like 20 minutes. Uh, and release them back to uh, uh, AWS VPC. But, uh, OK. OK, so, so question, questions here. Is it open source? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, th th there's some solutions. So as I said, the um, Flannel and Wave, um, they do similar things, uh, but a little bit uh, different implementation. We, we, th we, th we discussed uh, open source, so. Any plans? So any plans? Any plans to open source? I mean, we, we focused on internal things right now, so I don't know, maybe sometime. Okay, so next module, so basically it's a namespace allocator. We uh, ask if we need namespace or container. We create a container. We re return a uh, namespace reference back. So currently we use uh, a Kubernetes uh, sleep image for um, pod container. It does nothing, so it's very lightweight thing, but uh, it allows us to use network configuration as an independent piece. Uh, we're also using uh, container labels to attach uh, network information uh, to containers. So if, if you use uh, existing um, Docker networking, so it, when you do Docker inspect, you see all network configuration. But because we do custom thing, uh, there's no way to do this. So we basically parameterize our container with labels, which uh, have information we um, obtain, like IP address, uh, virtual internet, uh, and so on. So basically, all network information can be obtained through labels. Um, OK, last module, it's a namespace configurator. What it does, so it does final configuration. So there's a namespace reference, and there's IP which was allocated. There's some additional parameters like bandwidth, uh, port mapping if you want. So as I said, we do VPC IP addresses, but we also do uh, local IP addresses because, I mean, we still kind of keep back compatibility with existing approach, which still might be useful for bad jobs. So you, you can specify this. We create virtual Ethernet interfaces. Uh, we apply configuration inside the container. We do like IP routing, TC. Uh, we apply uh, configuration outside containers. It's routing, TC, NAT rules, uh, natural rules uh, necessary for local IP addresses of, or metadata proxy. I'll be talking about metadata, uh, metadata proxy later. So also it does cleanups when basically you release resources. Uh, we remove all the configuration we created. OK, so and basically how final configuration look like. So you see there are um, like, uh, four tasks. So uh, each task has a pod root. It's basically configuration created by the driver. Um, there's a policy between, um, uh, r r routing policy between uh, uh, containers and ENI. So it's basically how traffic uh, routed from ENI to containers. So any questions here about this slide? Uh, say, say it again, please. How do you avoid Linux's uh, reverse path forwarding checks? Reverse path. So you, if you have two interfaces connected to the same mm -hmm. subnet, mm -hmm. then 
Oh, OK. So, so basically, we, uh, it's, it's, we're doing policy-based routing, essentially. So uh, for each uh, container, uh, I, I have a slide about this. So basically, we specify from which interface uh, to which interface, which IP. So basically, it's uh, exact configuration from which container where it should go. So it's, you, you can do this with, with IP rule, essentially. OK. So, so and, uh, here's some configuration details. So I will, I will skip this slide, probably. So everybody understand why pod root approach or like it's vague. OK. OK, so some details how it's configured. Um, because it's uh, VPC IP, uh, we cannot use bridge, really. Because, I mean, sim simple use case, OK, if you use uh, IPs uh, from the same subnet, you kind of open the bridge and make them, uh, basically allow them connect to outside world. But uh, it's a little bit hard with VPC, so there is no ARP, really. And uh, because there is no subnet, so inside the container, we do like IP slash 32 configuration. Because your subnet is much bigger, so you cannot uh, assign this subnet to interface. Um, so we do, uh, uh, to your question, so there's basically uh, policy-based uh, routing. We specify from which Ethernet to which virtual Ethernet traffic goes. There's also DC rules applied on both sides. Uh, DC is basically traffic control, which allows us to specify uh, bandwidth for each container. So. Here's an example of a configuration. For example, uh, we have a container IP 166.23.90, uh, uh, virtual Ethernet, it's uh, virtual Ethernet A. ENI IP has, uh, so basically, I, uh, this configuration is behind Ethernet 1. There's also two routing tables, uh, to container and from container. And uh, let me show you how configuration looks like. So this is configuration from inside the container. So container has uh, ETH0 interface, so it has uh, this IP slash 32. The routing table is uh, default via, um, so uh, this IP address, uh, 10, 66, 30, 31, it's uh, ENI IP address. So basically it becomes gate gateway for container. And how we configure this, because it's slash 32, it's, it doesn't have subnet, so we say go through device directly. So it's how it configured inside. So from outside, uh, so our ENI is ETH1. So you see this thing, it says subnet. We have IP rule, which says from all to container IP, we specify explicitly from which Ethernet, it's Ethernet 1, and look up your routes in two container table. Uh, the second rule, it's from, <coughs> so basically it's reverse direction, from container, uh, traffic from virtual Ethernet, A, and look up a table from container, from container. So basically, we define uh, rules for both directions. Uh, and what is inside uh, these tables? So first table is two container, it's specified to which uh, virtual Ethernet traffic should go. And uh, the second rule, it's from container. It basically says where it should go outside, what's the gateway outside. So this 10.66.61, it's a uh, gateway for this subnet, big subnet. OK, so uh, any questions so far here? OK. Can we have both routable and non-routable IPs? Uh, can we have both routable and non-routable IPs on the same ENI? Yes, yes. It's, it's basically what we do. Uh, for um, So this example, I showed this example for uh, routable IP. Uh, for non-routable IP, it's similar. But in addition to that, it, we apply a uh, NAT uh, which goes through particular ENI. Can I answer the question? Yeah, so basically the same way. I mean, when you configure your network uh, and the, your IP is not routable, you apply not. Basically, you say, OK, do net network address translation. And the difference, uh, the only difference here, you apply not for a particular Ethernet interface, Ethernet 1 instead of Ethernet 0. So basically, the same thing as works uh, before. And yes, we still have routing rules uh, which specify uh, 
how we route traffic for local IP address. So basically, because we still have to know how to go to a particular container, which virtual Ethernet interface can respond to a particular container. Okay. Uh, could you repeat this? Who tracks the life, like the first pod container which you created uh -huh. for the namespace? Who tracks it? it is it the Titus, Titus modular or the network driver is responsible? It, it, net network driver tracks uh, the state. So network driver keeps the state of that. If it goes down, yeah. So, so we basically we don't, I mean, I mean, if container goes down, so uh, your application container will lose the network. Right. Uh, I mean, in this uh, case, uh, application container will be hot checked and will be cleaned up. In case of if we, uh, if application container crashed and we still have uh, this pod root, so we will uh, clean up. So basically, there's a garbage collector process which run periodically and uh, check existing configurations. So because, because uh, when we uh, consume existing network configuration, uh, we refer to another container. Basically, we do inspect periodically and check, okay, is there a container which still refers to existing configuration? If, it, if there are containers, so we kind of skip. If there's no container for some time, for example, like one minute, we start cleaning up and clean up. So do you reuse this pod container again? No, we, we don't. I mean, it's a good idea, but we don't currently reuse because there is some subtleties. Uh, basically, um, for example, next container uh, may be allocated uh, behind dif different ENI, and if it's behind different ENI, you can should change part of your configuration, and we try to be more atomic. So basically, it's better to destroy and recreate rather than like try to adjust to a new requirements. So uh, okay, yeah, basically it's what it does. So cleanups, consistency check as well, because so uh, again I will repeat this: be call. It was APIs in order to allocate APs, but we also have local state. So we periodically should check if our local state basically correspond to uh, VPC state. Okay, so how we uh, handle reliability? Um, we call uh, it was API a lot what we do here. So we do retries. It's basically recommended way by it was a API, uh, do retries. Uh, we do it for recoverable errors because it doesn't make sense to retry like if you see rate limiting or you see 500 errors. I mean, you retry a couple of times, but then you should fail. And it's better to fail fast in this case uh, because we have a higher level process, uh, Titus Master, which will reschedule our task to different Hosts, basically, in this situation, we think probability would be higher. The task will succeed. Uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, we have IP allocation cache. It uh, reduces number of uh, API calls because basically, if you instead of release uh, an IP address to VPC, release it also AWS call. We keep them attached to uh, an instance for some time. So basically, if your task crashed and we retry for some time on the same host. So basically we acquire IP address from the, from the cache. Uh, so again, inconsistent uh, state fixes. It's what we're doing. Another thing, um, basically, who familiar with AWS API? Who worked with AWS API? Okay. So uh, it, it basically not really atomic. When you uh, attach an ENI, so you do create, then you call attach, then you change some attributes, it's essentially three independent uh, calls. When you allocate API, uh, you call assign API to the CNI, then uh, it's, it doesn't return an IP immediately. So you should basically compare new state with existing state and see how it changed and which API was assigned. Uh, so basically, not, uh, not atomic operation. <laughs> it's also eventual uh, consistency here. What, what's going on? For example, you create an ANI, but 
in order to attach an ANI, when you call attach ANI, it might happen that it say, oh, it doesn't exist because the node you hit uh, didn't get information about ENI you just create. And uh, what you should do, you should retry for some time. So basically, it's uh, another problem you should deal with. Um, next problem, ENI attach, it's uh, a little bit slow. So it might take uh, total uh, about five seconds. So basically, you create ENI, it's fast. Then you start retrying before uh, you can call attach. So it takes about five seconds. Then uh, what uh, comes in place is basically how uh, ENI become configured on actual instance. And it then um, hot plug device detected, and it might take another 10 seconds. So basically, you should deal with this as well. So uh, what's the solution uh, here? So you can pre-allocate in advance. So you can pre-allocate all ENIs. Uh, you can uh, pre-allocate IP addresses, so you will reduce number of AWS calls. So this is basically the problem you have to deal with when you work with BBC. So um, what else? So the problem we start seeing uh, is basically BBC IP space. Because uh, we share the same BBC with existing uh, VMs. And we have thousands uh, of instances. And we have uh, thousands of containers. And eventually, you see, OK, uh, your IP space is shrinking. So how to deal with this? Plus, you have to guarantee uh, capacity. So uh, the solution here, uh, there's a way to increase VPC size. So it was recently introduced uh, the option when you can double the size of your VPC. So it kind of helps. Another thing, uh, you can completely separate uh, your account and run uh, titles in dedicated infrastructure, dedicated VPC. In this case, you have all VPC just for titles, just for containers, and it's kind of increased uh, the limit a lot. So it's what we also consider. So question here. OK, so uh, just some metrics. How, uh, what are the numbers here? Um, first graph shows uh, how many requests we got. Uh, it was today, I think, 9. 9.30 a.m. To, to noon, at basically some request uh, to the driver uh, to locate IPs. So the second graph is how many IPs were allocated. So it's basically 2K IPs. So brown, it's uh, routable IPs. And blue one, it's uh, non-routable IPs. It's local IPs. The green one is the size of the cache. So basically, if IP released, uh, it, become, it will be in the cache for some time. So you see it's going down. So this picture is uh, similar graphs, but it's for bad jobs. Uh, you notice that um, service style jobs is basically flat graph because I mean you start microservices it's running for some time, but bad jobs is kind of short lived uh, jobs. So you get a lot of requests for your short lived jobs. Uh, we allocate a lot of non routable IPs. The blue one is non routable IPs. So they're a huge spike. So they work for a couple of hours and then it goes down. So this is the latencies I mentioned. So there's uh, ENI create and attach first graph. So I mentioned it's up to five seconds. So this is a little bit better. So the purple graph, uh, the purple line, it's uh, how much time we need to create ENI, like actual AWS call to create ENI. The green one, it's uh, the time between we create ENI and we attach ENI. So basically, we did a couple of retries in order to get information about ENI. And then we change attributes on this ENI. It's like small piece uh, on top, so up to four seconds. Uh, this graph shows uh, latency for allocate and release. So the blue one, it's allocate, and uh, brown one, it's uh, release. So when you call AWS API, uh, give me new IP. So basically, it up, takes up to two, three seconds. So questions? Any questions? OK, so a couple of details uh, about metadata proxy. Uh, who knows what metadata is, uh, AWS metadata? So basically, uh, each uh, AWS instance allows you to get some information locally. So there's some endpoint 169 to 
uh, it's available with this IP address. So uh, your instance intercept this IP address and uh, allows you to access metadata endpoint. And in order to run your containers, uh, you have to mimic this thing. And basically what we do, uh, we create metadata proxy, uh, we mimic instance metadata and uh, return information which is specific to a particular container, not just instance. And what we do for each container when we create configuration, we also create a IP tables rule which intercept traffic from container to this IP address and uh, return information for particular endpoints which specific, which specific for particular container. So uh, why do we need this? So uh, first, some of the information used by our, um, our discovery uh, client so in order to get information, so I, our discovery client actually doesn't check current uh, Ethernet interface configuration, check uh, metadata proxy, give me my IP, and metadata proxy returns an IP, which is, uh, should be used to register uh, container to discover in, in discovery. Another thing is uh, IAM credentials. Who knows what IAM is? So basically IAM is a way uh, to restrict uh, which, which services you um, container can access. So basically, we uh, return IAM credentials which uh, specific to particular containers. When you access metadata uh, proxy, so you, can, you, you have role which assigned to your current instance. But if you run containers, you need uh, different roles, so basically what metadata proxy does. So there's a mechanism which called assume role. It's kind of, I mean, if you're familiar with Linux, when you do sudo, you can change your role, and assume role is the same mechanism how you can how in existing role you can get credentials for different role. It's what we do internally because each instance in AWS uh, has a role assigned to it, but in order to get a role for a particular container, you, do, you should do a same role call. Okay, so basically it was last slide, so any questions? Uh, not config. You, you mean metadata proxy? No, I, I mean we return some information. So as I said, uh, discovery client relies on this. Basically, give me my IP and some other information. So it calls metadata proxy, and this information already assigned to this endpoint. So basically, you just call and get information back. So it's how it works. You, you mean we, we, uh, which kind of configuration? For, uh, like Java applications, uh, some specific uh, configuration, like uh, which database uh, I want to visit. Uh, okay. Services. So, so but basically here we, here we don't do it. So we, we just provide an infrastructure how you can run your microservice. And basically that's it. So uh, how a particular container uh, access uh, particular service. So basically we provide mechanism uh, to configure security groups. So if, secure, if another service needs uh, ingress from your container, so you specify this security group uh, for your, con uh, you assign particular security group to your container and uh, another service should allow this security group uh, to access this service. If it's IAM, so uh, IAM assigned to container and then uh, because IAM assigned to container, uh, you should be able to access particular services like S3, for example. So, but it's what we do. I mean, everything else is uh, applic application specific, so we don't touch this level. Did you guys try out IP VLAN plugin because the whole approach is mm -hmm. to avoid the bridge in between because of port mapping? Yeah. But in IP VLAN, you don't need any port mapping so uh, we uh, yes uh, basically uh, because because we have module structure and uh, the mo c current uh, ip configuration module so let me just go back so basically uh, it's a namespace configura configurator module so today it does virtual ethernet but uh, we experimented with ip vlan yes uh, it's better we, we we haven't done this yet because basically it was less stable but yeah, we can we consider 
IPvLAN, basically. But you, you still need everything else. But you still need to allocate an IP from VPC. You still need apply this configuration. So basically, it we will change this model m module to IPvLAN, but. Right. It will only avoid creating the namespace. Um, no. you, you mean this one, right? Yes. Yeah, so in this case, yeah, so if it's IPvLAN and we create names, we still need to create a uh, namespace, right? And then when you configure IPvLAN, you, you specify to which namespace it should go. And are you going to share the slides? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions before we wrap up? Well, thank you so much, Andrew and Andre, for joining us tonight. And um, thank you very much for every one of you that sat here patiently 20 minutes over all the Iran time. I think the topic was way too interesting for any one of us to budge from our seats. So love that. Thank you again, Andrew and Andre, for uh, spending your evening and for the rest of you.